Day two of slush, how are we doing? Everybody got some energy? I'm, I'm not starting till I hear some noise. So, any energy here? Woo, perfect. Um, oh, that's funny. Let me quickly fix that for you guys. Uh, so, of course, you can see my notes that way, which is, I guess, fun. I'm gonna uh, mirror, stop mirroring, and do the extend thing. Yeah, that's, that's exactly almost there. Almost. Almost. Yeah, yeah. No, that's not. No, no, that's not it either. And then. Huh? Start from beginning. Presenter display options. Present from beginning. Presenter view. Full screen. Uh huh. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're getting there now. The latency doesn't help, does it? All right, cool. And then I go to that green button. See, this is why they make you send the slides up front, you know? All right, I think that works, doesn't it? All right, everybody, hello. My name is Simon. I'm the founder and CEO of Seaside. Um, started the company in the beginning of the year. Um, a bit about me. Uh, I got five extra minutes, so we're going to do a bit of that. Um, I'm homeschooled. I did my own thing. I kind of dropped out when I was 14. I didn't really enjoy being in a classroom where people told me what to learn. I wanted to do stuff so that didn't quite do it for me. I'm originally from Belgium. Um, because I was homeschooling myself, I had the flexibility to do my own thing. So I started contracting for Microsoft through various events. Um, I then moved to Dublin, lived there for a while. Um, after two years of happy living, I moved to London, where I joined Cloudflare. I was a solution architect at the time, and one of the things that I really loved doing and made my personal mission, because it was COVID, I, don't really had, I didn't really have anything else to do, was do their under attack on boardings a lot. So over my tenure there, I did about 100 of them. So people that were actively under attack, I'd be the person that they would call, and I would quickly fix stuff for them. So that was fun. Um, so I did that for a while, then rolled into product, and then joined Vercel, which I think a lot of us front-end people and developers really know as, and love as a brand. Um, but during my tenure at CloudSpan Vercel, I started to realize that there was a, a major gap in security, a big problem that had to be addressed, but that was also hard, and therefore a lot of people weren't really putting a lot of effort into it. So let's talk about browsers real quick, right? So when you go to a website, quite a few things happen, right? So let's skip ahead a few steps. You basically get an HTML file from the server you go to, and that HTML file tells you to get a bunch of stuff from other places, often places you control, so your own servers, uh, but sometimes third-party servers, things like intercom and ads and those kinds of stuff, right? Um, little segue. Has anybody here ever gone to the annoying site.com? Um, it's been around for like two, three years. Well, a fellow security researcher for us from Socket built that. He's awesome. He's an investor. He's a friend. He's great. Um, and so it's basically a website where you go to it and you press a button three times. It starts doing all sorts of stuff. Starts playing audio in the background. It's impossible to deal with. The windows start bouncing around. And eventually, you're going to end up having to close your entire browser down to ring a force quit because uh, it's just totally unmanageable. I think that neatly illustrates the sort of stuff you can do with browsers. It's pretty insane what you can do. And a lot of this is because of legacy APIs, right? So people using an API in a browser in the past, and because of backwards compatibility, browsers don't really get rid of old stuff. In fact, I was speaking to a person here who's very senior in security uh, for browsers back in the day, and he told me every type of attack they saw, they had about 300 ways that they wanted to tackle it. And every time they would do it, somebody would start crying, because people use weird APIs for good reasons. So we use a lot of these third-party scripts on our website. If you browse around the web, you'll bump into a lot of them. Usually websites have around 50 of them, some of them over 100. It depends on the site you go to. And so these scripts have a lot of power, right? So think of these scripts, as I mentioned earlier, that intercom widget, that Twitter thing, um, but also analytics tools like Google Analytics or whatever analytics AI company you use. There's plenty of startups here themselves that are third-party scripts, uh, but also advertising. Basically, just a whole bunch of stuff. And often, it's actually the marketing people that tell you, hey, we're going to have to add this thing to our site. 
and much more worryingly, even large companies don't really have a good compliance process for it. So they just chuck this stuff into websites, they forget about it, nobody even had a look at it, and they're totally dynamic. And these scripts can do anything. They could listen to your key, your key entry, so steal your login credentials, steal your uh, credit card information, but rewrite content on websites, right? So these scripts could literally change news on news websites. They could mine crypto in browsers. Fun fact, we made a website to demo that. If you go there, it's beverage.ltd. If you leave that window open, you'll make us money. Um, it's literally just mining crypto in your browser using your CPU, which is kind of ridiculous. So you could still do that to this day. It sounds like the supply chain, right? Stuff that you put in your website that is happening in the browser of your user, it sounds like something that is your problem. Well, it is, right? So you'd think that we'd all have kind of an idea of what's happening there. But when you ask your developers what's actually happening in the browser of users, you'll quickly notice that they don't really know. And it's kind of shocking, right? Because you spend so much money to protect your infrastructure and buy a bunch of these glorified boxes and firewalls. You spend equally, like the whole world together spends billions on open source monitoring of registries like Node Package Manager. But then we just allow entirely dynamic stuff to be fetched by the browser of our user. And so that's a major issue, right? Because these scripts are as powerful as all of this other stuff, and you're not keeping an eye on them at all. And so that obviously went wrong a lot. When JavaScript got added to browsers in 2010, of course, every, everybody started adding JavaScript to pages using third-party scripts. Um, back in the day, it was jQuery, right? So if you haven't been developing for the last few years, well, th there you go. That's a third-party script. And then in 2018, there was this really big attack. It's a while ago. I don't like to talk about it that much anymore. But British Airways had this happen to them, that in the browser, people's credit card information was being exfiltrated to baways.com. And that happened to about half a million people. That's actually a fun number, that half a million number they didn't really know who was impacted because, again, they weren't really keeping an eye on the client side. So they didn't really know who was impacted. So they made it up. They said it was there from date one to date two. And all of the transactions in the meantime have been impacted, which, of course, made it for a very expensive attack. Today, if you go to that domain name, baways.com, that was the one that was actually using the attack. We own that. You can read up on the incident. You'll be amazed by all the stuff that happens for that incident to occur. Now, then, oh, there we go. Of course, there have been plenty of other incidents. I've got a few that I call out here. So Ticketmaster got impacted, a bunch of other airliners like EasyJet and Air Europa, but equally Warner Music Group. These are large companies with very competent security teams. They spend a lot of money on security as well. And these attacks still happened. Um, Carlsberg this year has happened as well. Kaiser Permanente had a data loss incident because of these third-party scripts. There's just so much stuff just happening. And I mean, of course, security people have a lot going on. So this is an area that they know about, and they sigh. And then they're like, oh, yes, I know it's a problem. Um, and then eventually, it becomes a real issue, and they get impacted. And then their cyber insurer tries to cover them, but often, and I'll talk about that in a second, that doesn't work. So. Just looking back at 2024, we're going to do a whole blog post with them and working with some large outlets about this. Over half a million websites were impacted this year. Just one attack had about half a million already, and that was the polyfill incident. I was given a few minutes extra today, so I'm going to talk real quick about what that was. But then also a couple of other attacks happened. So in total, there were well above half a million websites that, had, that did this particular attack happen against them. So let's talk about the Polyfill thing real quick. So Polyfill originates originally from the Financial Times, right? Financial Times has lots of different websites, some that they manage, but some that are through agencies. And when people moved away from using Internet Explorer and moved to more HTML5, and then like Flash Player went away, they were basically tasked with figuring out a way to deal with these modern browsers and come up with a package that makes these things um, like more, more, more compatible. That's called Polyfilling, right? And so that script was hosted on cdn.polyfill.io. And a bunch of people used that for 10 years. You don't really need that script anymore, but it was still on half a million websites. And then this Chinese company managed to buy the domain name of that script and get access to that open source library. So they basically bought it off of one of the people that worked on it. And then that happened in February this year. A bunch of security companies flagged it. Funnel put this, um, oh, that's the wrong button. Funnel put this funny uh, thing on their website where they talk about that they're not liable for any security incidents. And that's just weird, right? Uh, and then in June, all of a sudden, even though everybody was warned about it, when you went to any website that had the polyfill script on it, you would be redirected to an adult content website or an online casino, depending on where you were in the world or your browser. So that's a pretty severe incident. Well, the fun fact is between February and June, we all assume nothing happened. Probably a very stealthy attack happened. And they were successful at it. And they just blew it up by making a super visible attack happen. It's pretty scary stuff. 
back then, the only real reason why people quickly removed it was because Google took away their money. They said, hey, if you're using this script on your website and you've got ads, we're stopping the monetization now until you let that script go, which is a right response in my opinion. And then threat feed vendors, so those virus total and risk IQ kind of companies, it took them more than 30 hours to flag it. 30 hours of everybody getting redirected to a casino, it's pretty long, right? All right, so that's my five extra minutes used up. Current solutions are just patently insufficient. And I'll talk a bit about this in more technical terms and I'll illustrate it more cleanly. Other security solutions out there, they basically just see the URL of the script. They don't even try to see the content and then they check that against threat feed vendors. But as I explained, it takes about 30 hours for them to do anything. Then others, they like try to download the script after the fact to analyze it. But it's a different browser, it's a different IP address, it's different headers, and every request can get a different response. So it doesn't really give you any certainty either. And then there's these other companies that just crawl websites and look at the scripts they have at that point in time. But again, every time you go to a website, you can get a different response from that other person going to that website. An attacker can impact 1% of people in the US and then move to France and then move to Germany and just fly below the radar. So that approach doesn't work either. To illustrate why that URL based approach is just ridiculous, um, so here are two boxes. One of them is a really cute teddy bear in there, right? And the other is a massive sting bomb and glitter bomb. Tell me which one is which. You can't, right? That's what that URL based approach is. It's just total garbage. It comes from a perspective of greediness. They just use the data they already have. They don't even try to analyze it. And that's very sad and it makes for a false sense of security. So that's where Seaside is fundamentally different to anything out there today. We literally put ourselves between that weird third party thing you put on your website that your marketing person told you to use and your end user. And therefore, when it flows through us, we keep an eye on it. We make sure that nothing bad is there and that anything that is bad just doesn't even make it there. We often make these scripts even a little bit faster because these third party scripts, they're often using antiquated technologies and just can be optimized in general. So we do that for you. And this is a cute illustration of what I just said. Look, the red dots are the bad thing and it doesn't make it pass. I got great marketing people, don't I? So pretty, there we go. Um, and so this is our dashboard. You get to see all of these really noisy scripts. We've cleaned it up a bit since we've put them together. But like, we actually give you the whole history. You're gonna be like, what is all this noise? Well, this is happening in your application when people go to your website. And then we actually, and this is even just a free tier, right? You're not even paying us a dime. We're giving you the full content of that script. We're analyzing it. We would automatically block it if it's a certain level of bad. We're not doing all the expensive stuff, but you can even see these other domain names in there that it gets its stuff from. You can actually see the code, which is a really big difference to any of our competitors. You can see what your users are getting, which is a really big deal. And then, of course, as I said, we make scripts faster because all of these things usually use antiquated technology. And therefore, the door is open for us to just optimize these things. And just to give you an idea, this is one of those examples where we make it like four milliseconds faster. There's examples where things became like 78 milliseconds became 48 milliseconds just by us doing our thing, making them a little bit faster. And ultimately, we just want to solve this problem. You know, like we're deep tech people, we're part of the W3 consortium, so we actually contribute to the new specifications of the, the, the web, the browsers. We contribute to open source projects regarding browsers like Servo and Chromium. Um, and we're also even part of the PCI Standards Commission. Actually, let's talk about that. It's a little boring, so like, give me my 10 seconds here. If you accept payments online, you have to comply to PCI DSS, the Payment Card Industry Digital Safety Standard. For years, you could just push that problem off to Stripe and be like, I use Stripe, they're PCI compliant. Well, the new generation that's coming in in March next year is actually a lot broader, and you now have to monitor these scripts if you have a payment form on your website. So you actually have to make sure that any of these marketing tools of yours, I mean, that you have a list of why they're there, that you keep an eye on them, that you audit them every seven days, la la la. You have to do something. If you accept a credit card, this is your problem. And you could use us just to comply with some of those points. And just in general, why wait for compliance? Browsers became this incredibly powerful environment that we build great applications in, but Therefore, also bad actors can use that to do bad things. And in general, there's just a lack of attention, even though we're increasing the usage of browsers, we're adding more stuff to it, we still don't have a clue what's happening inside of them security wise. And that's a major issue. I don't like how enterprise uh, security is usually put behind an enterprise paywall. So 
we made it really accessible. We've got a free tier. So if you just want to comply with those two standards, great. Use us. We love that. We like seeing those scripts that you have on your website so we can make sure that they're safe. And then we even have a business tier that gives you a lot more data. I think it's cheap enough that most businesses can actually afford to use us there. Could talk a bit about why us. We're great, but like the whole point is that we are client side scripts, we're a proxy, we see a bunch of stuff you don't see today. We can do great things with that, and our competitors just really aren't doing it anywhere near like we're doing it. The way we're doing it is particularly hard and painful, but I think it is also the only real way to do it properly. So, this is our team. There's 12 of us. Uh, we're globally distributed, fully remote. We do nice offsites. Uh, some of these are my ex colleagues that I worked with in the past. It's actually quite fun to be able to hire the people you loved working with before and then basically building your ultimate team through experience. That's pretty great. And so, these are all the companies that we've worked with and more. I think we know a thing or two about security at this point. So, we've got some great people on board there. And we're also hiring. We've still got a few roles open. So in case you want to dig deep into browsers and learn about new attacks and make the next generation of web security, you just let us know. We're backed by some really great venture capitalists as well. We did our pre-seed in the beginning of the year. We did our seed a few months ago, and I announced it in September. Um, so we've got Scribble Ventures, which is the fund uh, by basically the family of which the husband is uh, running product at OpenAI. Roar Ventures, Encore Capital, and Mantis. It's the chain smokers. If you ever heard of them, their music, that's them. That's awesome. They're great people. Security is just a mouse click away. You have to do something. You accept payments, this is your problem. And then the final question I'm going to ask you is, do you actually know what's happening in the browser of your user? If the answer to that is no, which I think it is, we should chat. Reach out to me on LinkedIn, drop me an email, go to our website. I'll be outside right around the corner right there. Let me know. I'm happy to help you. We're going to make this thing great. And then they also told me I could do a Q&A, but I actually ran out of time. So here's my catchy phrase. See you at the seaside. Thank you, everybody.